I'm sure uh, you have had a similar experience to me where there are times in your life where you feel like you're kind of caught in between two things, kind of in the space in between, if you will. Maybe at one point in your life you graduated either from high school or from college and you got a real job making a real living wage and at the end of the day you got in your car and you drove home and mom made your dinner and mom still did your laundry and everything like that. You were already in a sense an adult but mm, just quite not yet out on your own. You were somewhere in between. My son my oldest son right now is uh, in Little League, and he is in Coach Pick, now, or not Coach Pick, Machine Pick. Now, this is some sort of land in between t-ball and, like, real baseball. I have never, when I was younger, now, now I'm going to sound like I'm old. When I was younger, we didn't trot these contraptions out to the middle of the field to get a pitch and put the ball in and then teach it as a kid. What my coach would throw, and he would hit us on occasion, I think just to see if we were paying attention and to make us tough. But there's this giant contraption there, never mind that the poor kid at third base can't even see first base because the machine is so big. It's somewhere in between t-ball and, and what I would think of as more real baseball. We oftentimes in our lives find ourselves at a place where we're in between two things. Something of us might already be true, but we've not yet really experienced it, not yet gotten to actually be a part of it. We're caught, if you will, in that space between. And this morning, as we come to Luke chapter uh, 17, and it's on page 1,115 in your pew Bible, as we come here, we're going to look at life in the space between. The space between when Christ uh, died and was resurrected and even ascended up into heaven, the space between then and then when he will one day come again. Christians believe that Jesus is not gone forever, that one day he will return and he will establish a kingdom here on earth. We don't always talk about that a whole lot, but it is a hope and a belief that we have born out of what Scripture teaches. But right now, we're living in a space between those two times. And so we come here today to Luke 17, starting in verse 20. Before we began our sermon series on worship, if you remember, we, we looked at this passage. And the Pharisees questioned Jesus. They said in verse 20, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, he being Jesus, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And that phrase, in the midst of you, can mean it is within your grasp. Jesus, as he's speaking to the Pharisees, Pharisees, he's saying, listen, the kingdom of God, the thing that you're waiting for, it is here. It has happened. I am fulfilling what the Old Testament taught. I am here, and it's within your grasp. You, too, can be a part of the kingdom of God, that it exists already, in a sense, as it exists in the lives of believers, as it exists in those who follow after Christ. We come together to create, to be a part of the kingdom of God. Of God, So Jesus here is revealing to the Pharisees again that the kingdom of God is in the midst of them, that it's not what they expected. It's not a geographical kingdom. It's not a political kingdom. It's not an ethnic kingdom. It's a kingdom of believers. But then Jesus turns his conversation away from the Pharisees and kind of huddles his disciples in and gives them a bit more of an answer, something more specific. He elaborates on what he said to the Pharisees so that they can hear more about the kingdom that one day will come, the not yet kingdom, if you will. Now, a brief warning here before we start. We're going to get into some of those passages where we look and we say, this has not yet occurred. Prophecy for the future, apocalyptic literature, the kind of stuff that makes great movies and things like that. Warren Wearsby notes that in this conversation that we're into today, Jesus gives the disciples a warning. He tells them, don't become obsessed with trying to figure out where or when or how Jesus will return. Simply believe that it will be so, but don't sit here and develop your charts 
don't develop don't see all these things that uh, don't sit here and name who you think the antichrist will one day be he gives them that warning and we need to listen to that as well some of us get way more excited about a, an end times chart than we do about our neighbor who doesn't know who Jesus is so we want to keep things in the proper perspective we can. So what are we going to do? Number one, we're going to see the passage for what the passage says. I am not going to go elsewhere in Scripture to try and pull in all of the things that exist in Revelation and in parts of Matthew and Daniel and First and Second Thessalonians to try and build for us today some sort of great end times theology that will just have us leaving here going, wow, right? Not going to do that. We're going to leave the chart. We will leave the diagrams for another day or never. Okay? But what we are going to do is ask ourselves how we should live in light of what this passage says. Now, the passage that we're looking at was already read to us by both of you. We're not going to read it again. But some of you, if you were listening carefully, you may have thought, well, that doesn't seem as good as I read Jude every day. I mean, usually when we read a passage during uh, the offering time, it's something a little bit inspiring about how great God is and all these things. And yet Roland's reading something. I think I heard something about a horse. Uh, there were vultures in there. There's fire and sulfur being rained down. Something about Noah. A lot was in there. There's lightning happening. What kind of a passage is that to read? Sometimes people think that we read specific passages to inspire people to give. I don't know if that would work. A horse and a vulture doesn't really do it. This most likely is not a passage that we've gotten to and gotten out the highlighter and just been, been blessed with. Probably no one has really uh, perverse memorization when I said, and they said to them, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Right? I'm going to teach that one of my sons because I'm sure that's his Bible as well. I wonder what y'all are up to. But it's here. And in Scripture, uh, Paul says that all Scripture is profitable. Everything in the Bible is good for us. So this passage this morning that we've come to, it is good for us. And we want to see from here how Jesus speaks to his disciples and says, listen, this is how you live in this space between where I have come and established my kingdom in your hearts, but one day I will come and establish my kingdom in a physical sense. Here is how you live during the space between. It's this principle, if you will, of the already and the not yet. This is a big part of our theology, especially as we read through in the New Testament. There's a number of things that are true in our lives. For example, we have been forgiven from sin already, but we've not yet really experienced what that true forgiveness is and what it's like to be perfect and not sin anymore. Jesus, in his death and resurrection, paid the price for sin. He defeated sin but he has not yet destroyed it. So we have an already and we have a not yet. Already Jesus has established his, king here, his kingdom here on earth that exists through believers, but it is not yet seen in a physical sense. And we understand this in our minds because if we believe that Christ has established his kingdom, then we look out and we say something is wrong. Because if, if Jesus is reigning and if there's this kingdom going on, then why do we have pain? Why do we have heartache? Why do we have horses? Why do we have places where people blow things up? Why do we have criminals? Why do we have trials like the God Yard murder trial? Why do we have that? Because while there is an already sense in which Jesus has established his kingdom, there's also a not yet sense in which we have not experienced it to the full. We have not seen it in the physical sense. We have not experienced it throughout all of creation. It's the not yet. Mark Driscoll has said that the kingdom is both a journey and a destination. It's a rescue operation in this broken world and... It is a perfect outcome in the new earth to come, both already started and not yet finished. We're already there, but in the same sense, we're not yet there. So I hope you hear and sense and even feel sometime that tension that we live in. Like the song that we sang today, all I know is Jesus is coming back. 
this is not what we do. We live in tension. How do we live in tension? And that's what Jesus gives to his disciples, and that's what we're going to look at this, this morning. So starting in verse 22, although I do want to back up, it does affect how we live and it affects how we cope. When we understand that we're in the space in between, we live knowing that, yes, one day there will be a kingdom that we will be a part of, a physical kingdom that exists. But right now, we're not there. And we can't live our lives always pining for what will come. Just like some here live their lives always pining for what once was, back when we could run faster, we looked better, we could remember things and all that stuff. We also cannot live our life just looking forward all the time. We are here in this moment, in this space between, so that we can do the mission and the ministry that Christ has called us to do. This affects how we live. We know that the not yet is to come, but we don't live lazily in the moment. It also affects how we hope. We know that in our life we are hoping for things. We are hoping for the day when the pain will cease. We are hoping for the day when sin no longer has this hold on us. But we know that that hope will come someday when the not yet is here. So how we live and how we hope are drastically affected by this idea of already and not yet. How we live and how we hope, especially in this space between. So the first thing that we see in this passage comes in verses 22 and 23. And he said to the disciples, the the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not. And they will say to you, look there, or look here, do not go and follow me. Now what Jesus is telling his disciples here is to beware of the false alarm. I'm sure that many of you have experienced a false alarm at some point in your life. I was a school teacher before I came here to Cross Point, and when I was a school teacher, it was not uncommon to have a false fire alarm. Sometimes, you know, things just went haywire. Other times, you know, you have some 10th grader at Yahoo who's like, I want to study for math. What am I going to do? Best case scenario, oh, there it is, right? Fire trucks come. Everyone's got to file out. Not a good idea. Did it? Not a good idea. The false alarm. I'm sure many of you have experienced false alarms. When uh, Becky and I, uh, when Becky was getting ready to have Claire, we had a false alarm. We went to the hospital. You know, she, I mean, when your wife tells you the baby's coming, whether you think it's a false alarm or not, it's your body that tells you. So we get there, and then they tell me, and I'm like, oh, my God, here we go. Jesus is telling them there's going to be people who say, look, here's Jesus, or hey, he's over here. These are false alarms. Now, the picture that he's painting here is of people who would kind of come and say, even very quietly, look, Or, I know where Jesus is going to be. I know how and where. And I know when. I'm kind of ready for that. Plus, he's going to be my friend. I will wear his shoes for him. Right? And so that's the picture that's being painted here because that was not uncommon. In religious circles at that time, it was kind of common to think that someone could have a special knowledge. Someone could have an inside track on something. And so leaders would set themselves up. They would really make for themselves an occupation or a job or some kind of living by saying, I know something you don't know, and wouldn't you like to know it? And what Jesus is saying is there's going to be people who say that, and you are to not follow them. Really, he's saying you are to run. Now, in our context and in our world, we have people that say things like this, too. History is littered with people who will stand in front of congregations and stand in front of people and say, I am Jesus. I have returned. I do my job. Right? Now, if I ever stood up here and said this, and any of you thought I was serious, probably some of you would laugh. But what you really should do is, in that moment, get up and leave. Run away. Like, I... I left your car and just take off because this happened. And and we giggle and we think, well, who would ever follow after that? Somebody will. But 
being a cult leader is fashionable for some reason because people are hurting, people want hope, and so when you give them something, people will take it. Jesus is saying people are going to try and give you things. Don't take it. People are going to try and tell you certain things that are true about me. Don't believe it. Have the right kind of faith. Know what I have said to be true. How do we know when someone isn't making sense? How do we know when there's someone that we should be aware of? When what they say and what they do and how they live does not match up with what Scripture says. If someone is telling you that God said something and then you go through Scripture and say, wow, I can't find that in there. That person is a liar. God has given us Scripture so that we can know what he said, know who he is, and have faith in the righteous God. Beware, Jesus says. Some will come and they will say, here I am. There's a man in Miami, Florida right now. His name is Jose Luis de Jesus Milan. And he has a ministry called Growing in Grace. Where did that come from? I don't know. I mean, who doesn't want to grow in grace? I know I do. He thinks he's Jesus. He actually thinks he's Jesus and the Antichrist rolled into one, which must be some sort of multiple personality disorder. I would love to hear the argument from him. But that's what he says. And there are a lot of people who are following after him. In our context and in our lives, it may be that we are never tempted to follow someone who's going to Jesus so that they know who he or where he is and how he relates to us. But we may be tempted to follow someone else. We may be tempted to follow those people who will tell you, you don't have to do it to live right. You don't have to struggle. You just need faith. You just need the the right kind of faith. And then if you have the right kind of faith and enough faith, then you'll have everything you ever need. You want to drive a Mercedes? You want to have the big house? Call out to Jesus and he'll give it to you. You may hear those things. And when you go back to Scripture, you say, wait a minute. It's not that simple. We have to be very careful. The second thing that Jesus says kind of dovetails off of that. Beware of those people who think they have this idea of where Jesus is because when Jesus does come, it is going to be certain and it will be sudden. It will be certain and it will be sudden. All right, in verse 24, he gives this picture. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. The sky will light up with lightning. You have this idea of everybody being able to see everything. So you, you couldn't just say, oh, everyone will see it. Everyone will see it. It's this kind of universal, universal, visible idea that when Jesus returns, it will be certain and sudden and you will have no argument about it. No one's going to have to tell you because you're going to know. Now, sometimes people want to build a whole little picture off of this and a whole little nature picture thing and have Jesus return in a sudden and a lightning. It doesn't say that. It says that he, as he returns, it will be like that when it happens for you, suddenly. And it will be certain in that everyone will see it. I'm sure you've been with crowds before, you know, waiting, trying to wait out a game or something. And then as you're there and, and lightning is seen in the far off distance, everyone says, ooh. And you hear that because everyone sees it. This is the idea of the entire sky lighting up and there being no question, even if your eyes were closed. And you know how that is. Sometimes at night when you're trying to sleep and you hear the thunder and then the lightning strikes and there's that blanket lightning across the sky. Even though that your eyes are closed, you know it just happened. That's what's happening here. This lightning is such that there will be no denying it. It will be certain and it will be sudden. And then Jesus goes on to to paint this picture of not just a certain and sudden arrival here. He gives us a picture of Lot and of Noah. He calls attention to these two Old Testamenters to point out how it is certain and it is sudden. In Lot's case, when Lot and his family, we could read about this in Genesis, as they were led out of Sodom, as soon as they left, judgment hit Sodom. Jesus' arrival will be like that judgment that came certainly and suddenly. In the same sense, when God ushered Noah and his family on the ark, when he closed it and when the time was right, then the rains came and the floods came. It was certain and it was sudden. So Jesus is calling 
their attention back to things that they've seen and heard about before so that they will know. This is how the not yet and the already move. They move in a certain and sudden way. And this also means that there will be certain and sudden judgment. Certain and sudden judgment. And judgment divides. And we've talked about how there will be one left, there will be no taker. You can build a whole kind of argument about it, but that's what you're taking is how you're being judged. Where am I being taken from? Where am I being left here? Am I being left in paradise? Is that your judgment? Who gets to take it? Who gets to take it? Doesn't matter. Irrelevant. Red herring. Right? The idea here is that there will be a separation. The judgment will divide. That there will be no time to plead. Think about the story of Noah. Noah and the ark and his family, they built the ark for somewhere between 50 to 75 years. They took all of this time to build it. People laughed. People wondered, what are those crazy Noah family people doing? Building a giant boat in the middle of nowhere. And then one day, the judgment came. And as that flood came, Noah and his family were inside the ark, preserved, because God had saved them. But yet the people that were outside of that ark, the people that were outside of that ark experienced the punishment, experienced the judgment, those things that we don't always like to talk about, but that are a very real aspect of what life will be. And Lot's family, Lot and his daughters, are led out of Sodom. And as they leave, fire and sulfur rains down from the sea on everything. And then Lot's wife turns around. And she turns back to look, even though she was told not to. And what does she see? Certain and sudden judgment. Now this morning, we're in one of two places. Either we identify very well with one or the other. We look and say, well, you know what? Of nothing of my own accord, God has saved me. What a wonderful grace and mercy to know that despite how messed up I am, despite how rebellious my heart is, God saw fit to save me. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice that we have been saved. Or as we sit here this morning, we're thinking, you know what? I have been going around in my life and doing my thing. Who cares if there's a God? Who cares if the Bible says it's true about me? I'll make it there someday. I can do this on my own. It doesn't really matter. I'll just go about my life. And we move. Judgment will come to those suddenly and certainly. For most of us, that's how, that's how death looks. Suddenly and certainly. Even, even those who, who die of sickness and of illness oftentimes say, it's just like this. Those who are in physical death say, it's just like this. Many people feel like, I'm going to get that one day. They don't know when. Will one day be told their bodies are going to break down and they can't walk anymore? Will one day be told that they can't do this anymore? Is that going to be the judgment that they face? I don't think so. But the beauty of it all is that Jesus offers us a way to prove what Noah experienced, to prove what Lot experienced, to experience that salvation of being pulled out of a deserving judgment, of being brought out and instead brought into salvation. And he gives us a picture of that right in the middle of this whole passage. If you look at verse 25, we skipped over it, but now I want to go back. Verse 25 says, but first, Jesus is talking about how the lightning will come, the return will happen, but first, he says, he, he being the Son of Man, he being Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He must suffer and be rejected. Now, where we stand, this makes sense, because we know all about what's going to happen in the future. Jesus is going to suffer. Jesus is going to be rejected. That's the story. That's the, it's in all the movies. That's how it goes. But you have to understand, when they're hearing this, they're hearing about how the Son of Man will come, how he will reign in power, how he will bring his kingdom to earth, and then Jesus throws this in right in the middle. But this king who's going to reign, this person who will have all the power, who will be able to bring us all together, this person is going to be rejected and suffered. Which is scary. There's a tension. There's a 
doesn't fit in your life. But what Luke is being clear with, as he includes this here, is that the early church, the early believers, saw no difference in the Son of Man who suffered and the Son of Man who will reign. Jesus who suffers is the same Jesus who will reign. And while other people would look and have looked and say, your God is weak because your God has suffered, we say our God is mighty and our God is reigning. And we are able to enjoy that with him because he suffered, because he rejected. Do we want to live like Noah and experience that salvation? Do we want to experience the salvation that Lot and his daughter did? Then we can, but... Only if our king suffers and our king is rejected. And if you keep reading, it gives us two examples. That he is suffering and he is being rejected and his God is being weak for our sins. So we see also in verse 25 that the kingdom is a result of the fall. It is a result of And then this passage ends with this curious and cryptic promise that I doubt any of you have ever really thought of, and it's perhaps the first you've ever heard. Verse 37, and they said to him, where, Lord? It's the disciples, so it's a normal question for them. Well, where are you going to return to? Where should we look for you? He said to them, where the porch is, there the vultures will gather. And if you know about vultures, You know about birds like that? They gather around those things that they eat. Vultures eat dead things. So if you want to know where a corpse is, you look for the vulture. If you want to know when Christ will return, if you want to know where Christ will return, then you look for the sign. Scripture gives signs. It talks about there being wars and rumors of wars. It talks about there being earthquakes and natural disasters. So these are things that we can look for. Now, some of you might be thinking, that happens all the time. Exactly. There has never been a time in the Christian church where someone has said, ah, I don't think that's going to happen. Because there are always wars. There are always rumors of wars. There are always earthquakes. There are always natural disasters. So what we need to do, we can continue to look, but the vultures are always there. They are always there. What we need to remember is that this return will be sudden and it will be certain and that our job is not to figure out where, when, or how. Our job is to live here in the space between and to live as God would have us. So how do we do that? Number one, we live with real faith. Faith is believing that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he's going to do. As a believer, we live with real faith. You cannot know who God is, and you cannot know what he has said he will do if you do not read his word. I run into people from time to time who will say, you know what, Jason, I'm just not a reader. I don't read. I know you like books. I I don't know. I don't know. Okay, then don't read, you know, a big systematic theology quote and then just kind of open up like this and read through them. No. But as a believer, you don't have the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't read at readers. I just keep the Bible in front of me. I'm just going to read it like this. I'm just going to do what everybody else does. That's where you get into trouble. That's where you start to follow people who are like, I don't read the Bible. Here's a different picture. You have to be in your word. You have to be in God's word. And you have to be reading it on a consistent basis. We have uh, plans for that. We have different handouts that we can give you so you can look at the different content we offer. You can set you up with some sort of reading plan. But we live with real faith. God is who he says he is. He will do what he says he's going to do. One day he will return, and we believe that. Number two, we live in light of the return of the king. We realize that Jesus could come back at any moment, certainly and suddenly. And in so doing and in knowing that, that should affect our daily walk. It should affect how you live your life every day if you're thinking in the back of your mind, Jesus could be back at any minute. Jonathan Edwards, one of the great Puritan preachers of of America, of early American history, consistently used the return of Christ to evaluate his own actions. He wrote 70 different resolutions on how he wanted to live his life. Number 19 says this, resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do. If I expected, it would not be above an hour. 
before I secure the last trump. For Edwards, evaluating his life in light of the return of Christ helped him to keep all things in proper perspective. He was thinking, Jesus could come back at any moment. And if so, I don't want to be caught thinking that way. I don't want to be caught doing that. I don't want to be caught in that place. What a wonderful warning for us as well. What is it that you do on a daily basis that you would not be doing if you believe Jesus is coming back any moment? And if you can think of things in your mind, and to borrow a phrase from Pastor Matt Sam, Bobby, stop. Stop. And that may be easy, and that may be hard. And if it's something that you have a difficult time doing, we have ministries, we have programs in our church that are designed to help you with that. Don't fight it on your own. You won't win. And then we evaluate our life as we await the glorious return of our King. We live with our eyes open. I can only think of what it must have been like for Mary and Joseph. Where Noah and his family were praising God for their salvation, thankful that the boat had no leak, wondering about the canal, and enjoying the salvation that God had brought them. But at the same time, that joy must have been deepened by knowing that outside of their call, there were so many people, so many people that were going to hell. So many people that rather than experiencing salvation, were going to experience guilt and judgment. You can never get so joyful in your salvation that you can't give thanks to others for their gift of salvation. Our eyes need to be open that there are people around us, that there are people close to us, that there are people next to us that don't know Christ. And in not knowing Christ, they are in danger, not of just the sudden arrival of their king that they worship, but just the sudden arrival of a king that does not worship. So we need to be looking for ways in which we can reach out to these people. We need to begin to pray for them, to pray that God will open up their hearts and will give you the courage to say something. And not just to ask them about short scores or how the kids are, but to ask them pointy questions about their spiritual life. Ask them pointy questions about their walk. Get to a point where you can begin to share salvation with them. We're beginning a sermon series next week called Encounters, where we're going to continue through Luke and look at how Jesus encountered people, how people encountered Jesus. What a wonderful thing to invite them to. So just come out and hear them. Maybe one of them will resonate with you. Maybe the encounter that someone else has had with Jesus will resonate with you. We also have a parenting seminar coming up on the 18th of May. Maybe the person that you're thinking of, the person you need to share Christ with, maybe they're a parent. Invite them out to lunch. Come with them. Tell them to come on out. Be courteous to them. You can let them have them. This is an opportunity that we have to reach out to these people. We have to live with our eyes wide open. As we conclude this morning, we're going to conclude by celebrating communion with one another. And Paul tells us to do this as a proclamation of Jesus' death until he comes again. Until that not yet becomes the reality, we do this as believers. Now, we don't believe here at our church that there's anything supernatural or magical about what we're going to do. This is a remembrance. It is symbolic for us to remember what Christ did, that he suffered and that he was rejected on our behalf. So we come together and we share in that. At our church, we invite anyone, anyone who would claim Christ as their Lord to enjoy this with us, to celebrate communion together as we remember what Christ has done. But before we begin, Scripture offers us a warning. Paul writes that whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. He says, let a man examine himself, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So this morning, before we engage in this together, we're going to take a time where you can confess in your heart and confess personally to God those things that you have in your mind right now that you know need to change. Those things that you know over the past week you have done when you should not have. We have a time to confess that before we come here to remember what Jesus has done. So as those are coming forward who are going to serve, let's for us at least take a moment to silently confess what we know.
comes around, or as the, the plate says, as you take the cup that is laid out, he in front of you, the one pulled there, and the one taking the cup in front of you.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Scripture continues to say that for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that is what we do this morning. We proclaim that Jesus has died until the already and the not yet come together. In this space between that we live in, our lives, our words, our hearts, our deeds should communicate to people that we serve a risen Savior who has suffered and been rejected on our behalf, but who has cared for us and who has saved us despite our own rebellion. Will you please stand with me as we close with the reading from Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were indeed called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.